My name is Gerard Goulet, and I'm a member of the Adult Faith Ministry team here, who, as you know, is responsible for scheduling these adult forums. For the month of, of November, we're having a health-oriented team theme for the entire month. We're going to be talking about health from a holistic point of view, all different aspects of health. For example, we're going to have the Mission Forward team talk to us a little bit more about congregational health. We're going to have someone talk on personal health, particularly from a cardiovascular point of view. And today, we're going to have a talk on cancer therapy. Cancer, as you know, is a really serious diagnosis, but today's medical technology, we've got all these wonderful tools that can provide early diagnoses and treatments. We've got mammograms, we've got colonoscopies, we've got uh, chemotherapy, we have traditional radiation therapy. Today's talk is going to be on a new and emerging type of cancer therapy called proton beam therapy. This is something that is relatively new and it holds a great deal of significant progress with regard to uh, uh, promise with regard to cancer therapy. The Mayo Clinic is an expert in, in all sorts of different cancer treatments and Mayo is aware of the kind of promise that the proton beam therapy can hold. As a result, Mayo is, it, is investing quite a bit of money into proton beam therapy. There's a brand new building in downtown Rochester that houses the proton, new proton beam therapy equipment that will go operational in 2015. Today, it is really my distinct privilege to introduce our speaker for today. Our speaker is Dr. Robert Foote, he is the chairman of the Radiation Oncology Department at the Mayo Clinic. And he's also one of the recognized authorities with regard to proton beam therapy. Today he's going to talk to us about some of the facts associated with that therapy. And also, as with anything new, there's a certain amount of controversy associated with it also. So, it is with great pleasure that I introduce Dr. Robert Foote. Thank you, Gerard. I appreciate the invitation to come and share a few thoughts about proton beam therapy with you this morning. Uh, Gerard and I have connected in a number of different ways in the community. Uh, we participated in the Learning is Forever program at um, Rochester Community Technical College, and uh, he's come and uh, participated at our church. Uh, we do a wonder of the nativity at crash display every year. He likes to come and look at our crash displays. But the first connection we have is with his son Chris, who's a former member of this congregation. Uh, Chris was a resident in radiation oncology. We trained him, taught him everything he knows. He's one of the, one of the best residents uh, we've ever had. Unfortunately, we couldn't convince him to stay here in Rochester with us, and he now works at the Billings uh, Clinic in Billings, Montana. But we maintain a close working relationship with Chris and his uh, colleagues there. Uh, take off my Mayo Clinic hat and set it aside for a moment since we're together this morning as believers. Uh, we all have faith in God, uh, our eternal Father, our Father in Heaven, and in our Savior Jesus Christ, the Savior and the Redeemer of the world. And what I had here was a, a video of a scientist. Often there's a conflict between science and religion. This is a, a round, renowned uh, scientists who study the chemistry of the universe. And uh, our universe is made up largely of protons. That's the connection. 70% uh, of the universe is composed of protons. We'll be talking about protons this morning. And um, he has tremendous faith. Uh, 
faith in God and, and faith in our Savior Jesus Christ. And he sees science and religion working together as he has studied the chemistry of the universe. He had spectacular um, images of the universe and all the worlds that have been created and uh, shared his faith and testimony and belief in God as, as the creator of, of the universe and creator of life. So now I'll put my Mayo Clinic hat back on and we'll talk about uh, proton beam therapy. As Gerard mentioned, uh, proton beam therapy is a form of cancer treatment. And uh, cancer is a serious uh, illness. Unfortunately, it's becoming more common. Um, this year, about 1.7 million people were diagnosed with cancer. And it's predicted it's just going to increase with time. By uh, 2020, we're anticipating 2 million people each year will be diagnosed with cancer. It tends to be an illness of older people. The cardiologists are doing a wonderful job in helping us prevent uh, heart attacks and strokes, and so we're all living longer, come 80, 90, 100 years old, and uh, that's when we see a lot of cancers after age of 65. So that's one of the reasons we're seeing more and more cancer in the year. About a million uh, people <coughs> receive radiation therapy as part of the cancer treatment. And the main cancer treatments are either surgery, uh, radiation treatments, or, or chemotherapy. But most people, at some point in their disease uh, treatment, will undergo at least one, if not more, courses of, of radiation therapy. Um, about 75% of the people we treat, the goal of the treatment is to cure them, uh, which is the good news. Our treatments are becoming more successful. We're curing more people, helping them to live longer. About one out of the four people that we treat with radiation, the cancer is already spread. Uh, it's metastasized. It's incurable. But they have symptoms caused by the cancer. Uh, say a spread of the cancer to the bones, it's causing bone pain. Then the goal of treatment is not cure, but the goal of treatment is palliation, to relieve their, their pain and their suffering and improve their quality of life. The most common types of cancer that we treat are prostate cancer in men, and the breast cancer in women, and then lung cancer that we see both in men and women, and then these cancers, when they metastasize, frequently metastasize to the brain. So we often treat the brain metastases with, with radiation therapy. Currently, there's about 2,700 radiation therapy centers throughout the United States. So it's relatively convenient uh, to go to one to get treatment. Uh, the way the treatment's given is one treatment a day, five days a week, over several weeks. So it's a lot of trips to the clinic. Just here in southeastern Minnesota, we have a facility in southeastern Minnesota. We have a facility in Albert Lee and uh, Mankato, Northville, western Wisconsin. We're located in Montclair and La Crosse, and of course, the main campus here in, in Rochester. So, uh, what we use for radiation therapy today are X rays. And uh, the discoverer of X rays was Wilhelm Conrad Rentgen. And sometimes it's referred to as the Remkin ray. And uh, you'll be pleased to know that uh, uh, Dr. Remkin was a good uh, Lutheran. <laughs> a, a scientist with faith uh, and uh, made a great discovery. Uh, he was working in his lab with a vacuum tube and he was putting electrical discharges through it. And uh, he had, had it covered up so that no light would come from it. And he's in this dark lab, putting charges to this vacuum tube. And he noted on the other side of the room, there was a, fl a fluorescent board that began to fluoresce and, and lighten up. And he, he decided something was escaping from this tube and hitting that board and making it fluoresce. And he didn't know what it was, so he called it the x-ray. It was unknown. And that, that's how it got its name. And then he went on to further study that and, and, uh, and define and, and discover the actual x-ray. And this is the first x-ray ever taken. It's of his wife's hand. You can see the bones in her fingers and hand and the wedding ring. 
And that was the beginning of diagnostic radiology, x-rays, CT scans, MRIs, PET scans, the mammograms, all because of this uh, discovery of, of the x-ray. The problem with x-rays is that they pass all the way through the body. So we can put a film on one side of the body and then the x-ray tube on the other. The x-rays pass all the way through and different organs in the body absorb different amounts of radiation so there's a different exposure of the film and then you get the contrast in the image. Um, that's good for diagnosis but it's bad for cancer treatment. I'll try to explain it a little later on. What we've learned over the last 120 years using x-rays is uh, the more treatments we give, the higher dose we give, the more likely we are to cure the cancer and the longer uh, the patient's going to survive. Um, <clears throat> and again, the way we do that is we give multiple small treatments, one treatment a day, five days a week, over a six, seven, eight week period of time. What we've also learned is we can't isolate these cancers. They're surrounded by normal organs inside our body. And so as that x-ray enters in, uh, it distributes a high dose of radiate, uh, radiation on its entrance to whatever normal organ is in front of the cancer. And then it treats the cancer, and then it continues to exit out through the body, exposing the organs behind the cancer to the harmful effects of radiation. So we've learned that the higher dose we give to a normal organ, the more likely we are to have a complication. And the higher the dose is, the more severe and life-threatening that, that complication can be. So here's another faithful uh, scientist by the name of Ernest Rutherford, and he was the discoverer of protons. Um, I don't know what his denomination was, but there's a story that uh, he would sing hymns in his lab. <clears throat> and if things were going well with experiments, he would sing Onward Christian Soldiers. <laughs> and if things were going really well, he would sing it louder and faster. <laughs> Another man of, of faith and science who didn't see the conflict. And uh, uh, he was involved in uh, describing the atom. And uh, the atom is composed of a nucleus made up of positively charged protons and then uh, neutrons without any electrical charge. And then they have the negatively charged electrons orbiting around the nucleus. And he established this is, in fact, the way things are in nature, and uh, was able to isolate and demonstrate that there were positively charged particles uh, called protons. And uh, if, this is the uh, table of elements. I don't know if you remember this from high school or, or from college. Uh, this illustrates how important protons are. Uh, the, the number of protons in an atom determines its atomic number, so hydrogen has one proton, and helium has two protons, lithium three protons. And then the number of protons and neutrons determines its atomic weight. And then that atomic weight uh, determines its uh, chemical uh, nature. And as I mentioned earlier, 70% of the universe is uh, composed of, of protons. Uh, this gentleman is Robert Wilson. Uh, he's the one that first had the idea of using protons to treat cancer. Um, he was born and raised in, in Wyoming, and his parents weren't very religious. Uh, unfortunately, their marriage ended in divorce. He spent a lot of his childhood with his grandparents on his mother's side, and they were very religious. Uh, I think one came from a Baptist background, the other from a Methodist background. His grandparents had a tremendous influence on on this future scientist and, and incorporating his faith and belief in God and, and discovering the, the miracles of, of this creation. But uh, as a young man, he worked on the Manhattan Project during World War II, uh, developing atomic weapons. He was just in his 20s, and he was put in charge of research and development of cyclotrons, uh, which are particle accelerators, uh, equipment that accelerates protons, particles like protons, the very hot energies. And he was stationed in Los Alamos. And uh, when the Allies conquered Germany and the Nazis uh, surrendered, 
Uh, he suggested that we should stop all of the experiments and development of nuclear weapons. Um, but his point of view wasn't a popular one. And uh, they continued on and, of course, developed the atomic bomb, which was, which was used in Japan. And he always, he always felt very bad about that, a lot of regret, a lot of remorse. <coughs> he should have been more forceful in trying to prevent the development of atomic weapons. So after the war, he was one of the principal organizers of the Association of Los Alamos Scientists. And they petitioned that there be some kind of international control, not a national, individual nations having atomic energy, atomic power, but have some kind of international control of that. And the word he used is he wanted to make an atonement uh, for the sin of developing these atomic weapons and try to find a beneficial use of atomic energy and particles. And as he was studying and thinking about protons, he came up with the idea of using protons to, to treat cancer. About eight years later, in 1954, protons were utilized to, first to, to treat the first patient uh, with cancer in, in Berkeley, California. But it took you know, four, five, six decades for the technology to catch up with uh, the vision he had of using protons to cure cancer. So currently today we use x-rays. Uh, the future is protons. And I just wanted to compare and contrast uh, x-rays and protons. So x-rays are electromagnetic waves, like radio waves or ultraviolet light or visible light. Uh, protons, on the hand, other hand, are actually uh, particles. <clears throat> x-rays are massless, as long as they're moving and uh, they have no mass. Whereas protons in the world of particle nuclear physics are relatively massive. Uh, they don't weigh very much, uh, just a very small fraction of a kilogram. But compared to an electron, it weighs 2,000 times more than an electron, which is relatively massive. The x-rays we use, they don't have any electrical charge, but the protons do have a positive electrical and these differences, the differences between electromagnetic waves and particles, having mass and having no mass, having electrical charge and not having electrical charge, uh, makes a big difference in uh, their interaction with, with human tissues. So when the, the plan is to use very high energy protons to treat cancers. And uh, this is a cartoon of a human brain and it has a, a tumor drawn in it. And what we do with x-rays, uh, we send the x-ray into the brain to treat the tumor. So this is an x-ray beam. Most of the energy is deposited in the normal brain before it gets to the tumor, and then it continues to exit out. So there's an entrance dose, a very high entrance dose, a dose to the tumor, and then a lower exit dose. And the way we lower this entrance dose to make it safer is to send multiple beams in from different directions. So the entrance dose from any one of these beams is low, and we can focus and aim and concentrate the radiation on the tumor to try to get a high dose to the tumor to cure it, but a low dose uh, to the normal brain so we minimize the risk. But you can see what this does. It exposes a large volume of the normal brain to the harmful effects of low doses of, of radiation. Uh, the protons are very different. Um, with high energy, there's very low entrance dose. They deposit all of their energy when they slow down and stop. So we can determine how deep the tumor is, and then we can give the protons enough energy to get to the tumor and then stop. So there's a very low entrance dose that gets to the tumor, deposits all of its dose and then it stops. So there's none of the exit dose and there's very little entrance dose. We can get by with fewer beams. And so uh, this allows us to give more treatments because there's less going to the brain, give a higher dose, cure more people, and yet there's a lower dose to the brain. And so there's less uh, harmful side effects from, from the radiation treatments. So I wanted to share with you uh, 
a couple of examples of how it works. Um, one of the groups of people that benefit the most from the proton beam therapy are the children whose organs are growing and developing and are very sensitive to the harmful effects of radiation. Now we can cure 85% of the kids with cancer. They're living to become adults. And what we're finding out 10 and 20, 30 years later are the harmful long-term effects of our treatment, whether it's surgery, radiation, or chemotherapy. And two out of three kids will have chronic health problems the rest of their life because of their cancer treatment. And 20% of the kids will actually die because of the severe complication related to the cancer treatment given to them in decades earlier. So this is a child uh, with a brain tumor. This is a CT scan of their head. This is their brain here. And uh, these are the structures for hearing in the ear. And uh, with surgery to remove the brain tumor and then radiation treatments to treat the brain tumor, we have that 85% uh, percent cure rate. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to step away from the mic for a minute to, to show you a video of how we how we used to treat the patients with radiation. So we'd send one beam in from the left and then another beam in from the right. Remember these beams pass all the way through the body to get the full dose to the brain. And uh, that cured 85% of the patients. But one of the long-term side effects of radiation to the brain is it lowers the IQ, and so the kids need special education. The other harmful effect was on the hearing in the ears. Uh, they lost their hearing. So not only did they have a low IQ, they couldn't hear. And they need expensive hearing aids, they need special education at school. They'd really struggle to graduate from high school. They may not be able to go to college and become a productive uh, member of society. So then what we started to do was something called three-dimensional conformal radiation therapy or intensity modulated radiation therapy, where we'd send these beams in from multiple different angles trying to aim and focus and concentrate it more on the brain and reduce the dose to the ears so they wouldn't have the hearing problems. And this, this worked. As you can see, we get a very high red dose to the brain to cure the cancer. We get a lower greenish bluish dose uh, to the ear area. And so they didn't have the hearing loss. They didn't need the hearing aids. They did better in school. But that radiation had to go somewhere since the x-rays passed all the way through the body. And you can see it went out into the face. And what we learned is this stopped the bones from growing. So the kids had physically deformed faces. And then when they were 20 and 30 years old, they developed cancers in the bones or the soft tissues of the face because of the low dose of radiation exposure. And uh, this is a child who was exposed to radiation as a, when he was even younger, cured of the cancer, but you can see what it did to the bones. They stopped growing to one side of the face and became physically disfigured. This is one of the controversies with x-rays and protons. Uh, you know, protons are more expensive. Uh, it's more expensive to treat them with protons than with x-rays. What we have a hard time doing is putting a dollar amount on this. You know, what is this worth? Um, is this worth paying a little bit more to get protons to prevent something like this from happening? Um, and we don't have a good scientific way of putting a dollar amount on these types of side effects and complications. So with proton beam, we can send it into the brain and just treat the brain and then it stops before it gets to the ears and it doesn't exit out through the face. And so we can treat the brain and cure the tumor. No hearing loss, no facial deformities, no radiation-induced malignancies uh, later on in life. Uh, that's why we're excited about... <coughs> that's why we're excited about uh, proton beam therapy at, at the Mayo Clinic. And really the controversy is over money. You know, can we afford uh, to do this? 
And this is a study from Sweden. Um, whether you like it or not, but, but there's politics involved. They have a, a single payer system. The government pays for the health care. And they can track a person throughout their life and know exactly how much money the government spent on that human life. And uh, a child like the one I showed to you with the brain irradiation, uh, to treat them with protons back in 2005 cost 10,000 euros. Uh, with x-rays it cost them 4,000 euros. So it's two and a half times more expensive to treat with protons and x-rays. Now a lot has changed with the technology over the last 10 years. And protons, instead of being two and a half times more expensive, it's one and a half times more expensive now. So that the cost is coming down with time just as it does with any new technology. Yes? Uh, I was wondering, that's all the differences in the cost so she's asking about what about the health care costs throughout the child's life and they were able to track that in Sweden whoops and uh, it cost them another 4,000 euros to treat the side effects related to the proton treatment it cost them another 34,000 euros to treat the side effects related to the x-ray treatments. So there was a cost savings there of about 30,000 euros. So if you take into account the cost of the treatment and then the cost of the side effects related to the treatment, it was 14,000 euros for the protons and 38,000 euros for the x-ray treatments. So that's been Mayo's argument is we may have to pay a little bit more up front, but in the long term, over that patient's life, it'll actually reduce the cost of health care, it'll improve the quality of life, improve their function, uh, it'll be good for society, it'll be good for, good for payers. Let me just share with you a, a few patients that uh, we've been involved with. This is Annika, a young lady with a cancer that was located in her nose, in her sinuses, right between her eyes. In fact, she was, the cancer caused blindness in the right eye. It was surgically inoperable, and the treatment was a course of chemotherapy uh, followed by radiation treatments. Here she is during her chemotherapy where she's lost her hair. And this is her MRI. Uh, this is her right eye, which is blind, and here's her left eye, and this is her brain back here. And this is the tumor uh, outlined in the red right there. Uh, you can see how the tumor came over to the right side and took out the vision in the right eye with the optic nerve. It's really close to the left optic nerve. So the challenge we have as radiation oncologists is how are we going to get a high dose of radiation here and cure her without destroying the vision? She's already blind in her right eye. How can we save her left eye vision and not harm her brain? Well, the solution to that is proton beam therapy. So we sent her to MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston. She, she was treated successfully with radiation therapy there. Cured of her cancer, still has vision in her, in her uh, left eye. In fact, if you go to her house, you'll see she's quite an artist uh, with drawings and paintings uh, all over her, her home and her bedroom. This was a young high school football player uh, with back pain. He thought he'd just been tackled hard. But when the pain didn't go away, imaging was done of his back. He was found to have a childhood tumor called a Ewing sarcoma. And again, this was inoperable. Surgery wasn't an option. He received 42 weeks of five different chemotherapy drugs, and then a course of radiation treatments. <clears throat> and these are actually two, two young men, exactly the same cancer, exactly in the same location. And this is a CT scan of the young man. And you can't see it very well, but the tumor is right here in the back, right next to the kidney and the spinal cord. Uh, and here's the tumor on this side. Kidney here, there's no contrast, so the kidneys don't light up as well. Kidney here, kidney here, spinal cord. Both got the same chemo. This patient was treated with x-rays, the conventional standard, and this patient was treated with protons. 
You can see what happened to Roy treated with, with uh, conventional x-rays. The exit dose destroyed his kidney on the right. It's shrinking up, going away. His kidney function is elevating. The, the chemotherapy harmed the other kidney. You may be looking at a kidney transplant uh, for the early on. This boy was treated with protons. Both were cured. <clears throat> but look, normal kidney, same size as it was originally. Normal kidney function. He's uh, living well, very active. Uh, no, no problems with his, with his, with his health. Uh, this is Yao Lin Zhao, <coughs> excuse me, um, in the red sweater here. Uh, when I first met her, she was a senior at Duke University. She had just a few weeks to go in graduating, and she was diagnosed with a brain tumor. And uh, she underwent surgery at Duke University to have the brain tumor removed. And after graduation from Duke, she was moving to Rochester. Uh, to go to the Mayo Medical School. And she needed someone to follow her along here and, and uh, make sure there was no recurrence of her brain tumor. So she came to Rochester and started medical school and about a year or two in, unfortunately, uh, she suffered a recurrence uh, of the brain tumor. And here's an MRI of the, of the brain. Here's the brain and here's the tumor right here. You see it's a relatively large tumor and it's right in the middle of the brain. It's surgically inoperable. Now we have a medical student with an inoperable brain tumor located in the center of the brain. And we know what radiation does to the brain, right? It lowers IQ. In fact, we were doing IQ tests on her, and we saw that as the tumor occurred and grew and got bigger, her IQ was dropping. And so we sent her to Boston, to the Massachusetts General Hospital, uh, where she was treated with proton beam therapy successfully. Here's her follow-up MRI scan five years later. Tumor's gone, and uh, her IQ actually came back up uh, to where it was uh, before the tumor occurred. So no harm to the brain and a cure of the brain tumor. She not only graduated from Mayo Medical School, but she received awards and recognitions for the research she did as a medical student, and uh, went on to um, to do a pathology uh, residency program, and now she's going to do a fellowship in model pathology. So uh, we, we feel so good that uh, we're able to cure the tumor and uh, preserve her intellectual uh, capabilities. Um, that's why Mayo is, uh, is investing so much money in, in proton beam therapy. So in closing, I was just wanted to show you the equipment we have uh, over in the Jacobson building. Uh, the source of our protons is a bottle of hydrogen gas. And uh, this is 31 cubic feet of hydrogen gas. There's about 80 grams of hydrogen in that bottle. Now if you'll remember, again from high school or college, Avogadro's number, that's 6 times 10 to the 23. That's how many protons there are in a gram of protons. So that means there's 5 times 10 to the 25 protons in this bottle. That's 5 with 25 zeros behind it. That's a, that's a big number. It takes 5 trillion protons to treat a patient. Uh, so that means we'd be able to treat 10 trillion patients with this bottle of hydrogen gas. We, can treat, we have the capacity to treat about 1,200 uh, patients a year. So this bottle of gas will last 8 billion years. <laughs> and it costs about $200. So the protons are not very expensive. Expensive at all. What's expensive is getting those protons up to a high enough energy to penetrate into the body and treat the cancer. So it requires something called a linear accelerator. On this end is what we call an ion chamber, and uh, it separates the electrons from the protons, and uh, causes ionization at extreme heats, and then we separate them, and the protons go down this linear accelerator. They're accelerated up to about 7 million electron volts, and then injected into what's called an accelerator, a synchrotron. This is a picture of the synchrotron. Uh, here's the, uh, the bottle of gas is right down here. This is a linear accelerator uh, injecting the protons into the synchrotron. 
And the synchrotron is just a series of four big magnets and uh, an accelerating cavity here. These magnets just keep the proton spinning around in this circle. And each time they go around, um, this accelerated cavity gives them a boost of energy. So they go faster and faster and faster every time they go around this loop. And we accelerate them up to about two-thirds the speed of light, which is about 230 billion electron volts. And it takes about two seconds to do that. So they'll travel the circumference of the Earth about 10 times in two seconds, since they're going two-thirds the speed of light. So once we have them to the energy we need, we can extract them out of the synchrotron and send them down this beam line uh, into our five different uh, treatment rooms. This is a close-up of the beam line. It's just a series of magnets. The protons are going through this pipe. And these magnets keep on aiming and focus going down the center of the top pipe, so they're not bouncing on that around and losing protons. And if we need to move it into the treatment room, so the protons are going down this pipe here, and this is the entrance into the treatment room. We have a big red bending magnet that bends it out of this pipe and into this pipe, focusing and straightening magnets to send it into the, into the treatment room. Uh, this is an illustration of what the treatment room looks like. There's a robotic table that has six degrees of motion. It can position the patient in the X, Y, and Z position, also pitch out and roll, with imaging devices. So we know that the protons, we know where the protons are going to go in the patient. And uh, the robot can adjust to within less than a millimeter accuracy. Uh, the protons come in back here, and they have to be bent 90 degrees to come out the nozzle. And then this nozzle can rotate 190 degrees around the patient. So between the nozzle rotating 190 degrees and the robot positioning the patient, we can send that beam in from any angle uh, to get to the tumor. These magnets that uh, bend the beam uh, weigh 40 to 60 tons. And in order to rotate those magnets with submillimeter accuracy, requires a steel gantry, and the whole apparatus weighs about uh, 140 tons, and it's about three stories in, in size. This is a look behind the scenes. This, scenes, this is the, the gantry here, and uh, this is looking into the treatment room, and these are the big red bending magnets here. It rotates up above the patient to the side of the patient, and rotate down around and underneath the patient. Here the magnet's in a horizontal position. This is the big red bending magnet. The nozzle's here going into the treatment room. Again, this can rotate up above the patient or rotate down below the patient. This is what the patient will see. They don't see anything that's going on back behind the wall. Uh, this is the nozzle where the protons come out. And you can see it can rotate up above or rotate under the patient. This is the robot that positions the patient. And here are the imaging devices to make sure we're going to hit the target before we push the beam. Yes? So the building has looked very finished for several months. Is this what's delaying treatments to begin until the middle of 2015? Right. We're, we're irradiating human phantoms now. They have radiation measuring devices inside of them to make sure we can hit the target. And the distribution of dose within the target is what we calculate. So we're going to practice thousands of times before we put a patient on the table and treat them. So that's what we're doing now. Uh, at Mayo, uh, we have something called pencil beam scanning. The size of our beam would be about the size of a pencil, anywhere from two to five millimeters, depending upon the energy of the beam. You know, the smaller the beam, the more accurate it is. And what we'll be able to do is, is uh, treat the deep part of the tumor and then back off on the energy. And since protons are positively charged, we can use a magnet to move that beam around to paint the dose of radiation within the tumor, and then back off on the energy, treat another layer of the tumor, back off on the energy, treat another layer of the tumor. So we're really painting radiation dose inside the tumor, and it only takes you know, less than five minutes to do all of this. I'll play one more video to again show you the contrast between what happens with x-rays what happens with proteins.
So that's the conventional x-rays that pass all the way through the brain. And this is the pencil beam scanning. It shows that we'll treat the deep part of the tumor first and then change the energy of the beam so it doesn't go as deep and treat another layer. We've got magnets that move the beam back and forth because of its positive charge. We just treat the tumor layer by layer until it's completely treated with radiation. And so um, we avoid the harm to the brain, unnecessary dose here. We don't have it here, and we can get more treatments, higher dose, or fewer treatments for the higher dose uh, to the brain tumor. I, won't, I don't want you to think this is only used in the brain. It could be a tumor inside the lung that's surrounded by the heart or the lung. It could be in the abdomen, surrounded by the liver, the intestines, the kidney. Um, so any, any tumor located anywhere in the body that's next to some critical organ, but we can treat it more safely, more precisely. Uh, proton beam with infections. And uh, we will be ready to treat our first patient in the Jacobson building here in Rochester in June. And then uh, we have a similar facility in Phoenix and we'll be ready to treat patients there uh, early 2016. And uh, that's all I have to say about proton beam therapy. Thanks for your interest. It looks like we got a few minutes for some questions. I, okay, well, one or two. Okay. I was really mystified when you said that it, there's no entry damage to tissue and it's not until the beam stops. Is there any analog that you can give that could explain that without deep knowledge of physics? No. Okay. <laughs> I'm a physicist. Uh, it's a. Uh, it's an observation of nature when you look at the dose distribution, the ionization of the proton, that it's, um, it's related to its energy. It's related to its energy. So at high energy, there's very low deposition of, of dose and ionization. It's only at the low energy where it stops that the energy is released. And so if you plot ionization and energy by depth in the tissue, there's very little but it's very high energy entered into the body, and there's what's called the Bragg peak. When it stops, all of its energy is released. You get this huge explosion of energy, and then boom, it stops, and it doesn't proceed any further. So that's a very shallow range? It isn't like a ramp up? To no, it's, it's called the Bragg peak. It's very sharp. Oh, very sharp. Yeah. Excellent. I think this lady was next. Does the Mayo Clinic refer all of their patients to Boston right now for the proton treatment? And does insurance cover the treatment? We, uh, we send our patients mostly to Boston, mostly to Houston. Uh, there's a facility in Jacksonville, Florida we send patients to. Those are the three main uh, places. Uh, we're getting a lot of pushback from insurance companies because it is more expensive. So our approach has been, we think this is so important that we're going to charge the same we do for x-rays. We want to take cost off the table. So if we talk to insurance companies, we'll say, you know, we want to be able to use this. We don't want cost to be an issue. We'll charge the same we do for x-rays. And please let us use this on the patients. So it depends on the insurance company. It'll depend on the Boston Yeah, whether they get... Whether it gets paid for or not depends on the insurance company. Um, either Mayo will have to do charity care if the insurance company won't pay for it, or the patient will have to pay out of pocket if the insurer won't pay out of it. That's pay for it. And this actually goes one step further than that. It's actually your employer. Your employer de determines what's included in your health plan, and then they develop a contract with the insurer. So we're doing a lot of negotiation with the employers in Minnesota, 3M, Cargill, Boston Scientific, General Mills, to convince them that this is a treatment they want available to their employees so that they'll ask the insurance companies to include this in their, in their health plan. So how does the Mayo Clinic determine who gets the proton and who gets the x-ray? Just, by their Just like every other patient that comes to the Mayo Clinic, they'll be seen by a team of physicians and if we think the proton's best for them, we'll recommend proton beam therapy for them. And then, if their insurance company covers it, we're off and running. If their insurance company 
doesn't cover it. There's usually several week delay as we go through the appeal process. Sometimes it ends up in lawsuits uh, before the insurance company will pay for it. Or, um, or they'll pay out of pocket, but they don't want the delay or mail to do the charity. What does the body do with the tumor that's been destroyed by photons? Does that make any problems? The, um, the body, we have cells. That, as these cancer cells die, we have cells that gobble them up and eat them. And then they're excreted out through the urine, basically. Um, usually scar tissue is left behind. You get fibrosis and scar tissue. Fibroblaster laid down where the cancer was. <laughs> yes. Do you foresee a day when it will gravitate to this replacing? Yes, cancer? this will replace X-rays. Um, you know, in the patient that's dying of cancer and doesn't have long to live, and we're not worried about long-term side effects, X-rays will be a less expensive option in the near term. But eventually, everyone will have. I think there was another question back here. Is, um, is, are cancer cells that much different? Why, why does the beam stop at a cancer cell versus, you know, a tissue? Where the beam stops uh, is determined by the energy of the beam. So we use the CTs, the MRs, the PET scans to determine where the cancer is and how deep the beam needs to go. And then uh, we give the beam that energy so it'll go to the tumor and then stop. The cancer cells can't repair radiation damage. The normal cells can repair a lot of radiation damage, but the cancer cells can't, so they die. If there's any harm to the normal cells, most of that is repaired, but not all of it is, as we see. But yes? You Protons in the physics research labs in the 50s, 60s, and 70s at Berkeley and in Boston. The, the first real clinical system in a hospital was located at Loma Linda University in 1990. And um, the, the challenges with the proton beam are it's so accurate you might miss the tumor, especially at a, a moving target. That's a challenge for us. Something in the lung that's moving with the respiratory status, the respiratory cycle, the cardiac cycle. Uh, that's a challenge we're still working on moving targets. So the, the problem is, is if you miss the cancer and you don't cure the patient, and if you miss the cancer, then you get something more than cause it. But as long as you can verify that you're hitting the tumor and you're not the normal organ, then, uh, then you should do well. Yes. Uh, I guess I'm a nurse. Uh -huh. So my uh, question is related to staffing and you know healthcare workers involved in treatment. What is their role? Yes. Um, well, we besides the physician that determines what type of radiation to use and what kind of dose to use, we have medical physicists that. Um, to verify all the dose calculations and make sure the equipment's working properly. We have certified medical dosimetrists to do all the dose calculations for us. We have radiation therapists that actually run the equipment and treat the patients every day. And we have nurses that help uh, monitor the patient throughout the course of treatment and treat any acute side effects. We have nurse practitioners and physicians assistants that provide long-term follow-up and care. We have dietitians that monitor their nutritional status throughout the course of treatment. We have social workers that attack the, the insurance issues, um, depression issues, anxiety issues, uh, disability issues. We have chaplains that help with the spiritual issues. I guess I was wondering if there were less involvement of health care workers because it's so fine-tuned and so computerized and so um, robotically 
And I wondered if we removed that human factor of the healthcare team. We still need the human factor. We need more physicists because the equipment is, is more complicated. This is the most complex piece of medical equipment that there is. So it actually takes more people out of the best people. And that's why it's more expensive to operate uh, because of that. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.